again. Welcome to another episode of Leading from Alignment with our, our coach, mentor, and friend, John Obaluski. How are you today, John? Jim, I'm well. Good to be with you. Uh, appreciate you more than you know. Right on. I, I say the same thing. I think people think, like, did they talk this way all the time? Yes, we talk this way all the time. Right. And we, and we mean it. So good friends are a gift from God. So today, speaking of gifts from God, we're going to talk about uh, culture. Again, this is kind of our part two of, of the culture, you know, biathlon here and how to, yes. uh, we talk about how to identify it, but now we're talking about how to, how to define it and refine it. Could you give us kind of a, kind of a, a two minute version if they missed the last podcast? How do you, how do you just kind of, what questions do you ask yourself to say, this is our culture, and then we'll get into how to refine it and define it. Right. So in, the, in pod 91, Jim, we talked about why this all matters, right? We, yeah. we said that culture is fuel. Yeah. And if you have a wonderful vision, a great playbook, but your culture is unhealthy, um, your culture will win. Yes. It always wins. <laughs> yes. And, and so we kind of, that was kind of the backdrop for why we wanted uh, those who are listening and watching to pay attention because it matters so much. And you have culture. Yes. Whether you acknowledge it or not, there is a culture. At Whether the, you created it or not, you have a culture. Right. Yeah. Some of you listening and watching today have inherited a culture. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that needs some, some shaping and some, and some uh, tending to. So we talked yeah. about the starting point of shaping culture, and that is identifying core values. We right. said core values um, are not aspirational values. They're not right. permission to play values. They are the behaviors that are inherent already in the organization you were you were leading and right. inherent within you as the leader. Right. Um, you know, when we identified, we, we started Converge Coaching eight years ago, Jim, a little over eight years ago now. Um, I didn't know what our core values were, but we were already operating yeah. with a strong set of behaviors that we believe deeply in. So we right. talked about um, uh, what they are. They are identified more than created. They are behaviors, if we can think about them that way. They're, yeah. they're behaviors that um, I call them the behavioral rumble strips of an yeah. organization. So right. when I hit that rumble strip on the freeway, I course correct very quickly. That's what a core value is intended uh, to do. And then we talked about how to identify core values and some questions that um, we encourage leaders to ask themselves. Sometimes they ask us to come help that discussion yeah. uh, along. Um, but here's one of the first ones we start with. And then if you want the rest of them, just peel back yeah. to 91 and you'll get them. But is there, if there was anybody in your organization that you wanted to clone, who would that be and why? Right. Right. Why do you want more of this? Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And that gives you a window. It gives you a, 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 an opening to what's important to you. Yeah. Behaviorally as a leader for the organization you're leading. So that's kind of what we talked about in pod 91. Right. Okay, good. So now we're going to take it a step farther because now, you know, they've had a week to think about this. Most, most of the audience has, has done that. And they're thinking, okay, I got, I got six, seven, eight things that all make sense. They're biblical, they're, they're values that I have. And now we're going to talk about how to define those, give them the proper language, right? And refine those because maybe eight is too many. That's <laughs> really yes. to say anything at all. It has to be memorable. So right. Help us with that. What do you what do you do to refine and define these values? So we ask we we ask three questions, and I encourage the the leader of an organization to start in in his own prayer closet, in his room, in his office, Please. asking these three questions first of those values that that he or she has identified, and then we're going to take these questions to the broader leadership team for discussion. Yeah. Here here we go, real quick. I'll give them to you, and then we'll explain them. First one, what does that value mean? Right. What does it mean? We said last week, Jim, that uh, our, the first value we identified was compassion driven. Yeah. Well, compassion, that word compassion means different things to different people. Right. Some people think of compassion and they think of a, a syrupy feeling um, that I never, I never challenge anybody because I'm compassionate. It means nice. I'm a nice person, you know, <laughs> none of that's not true. But for us, what compassion means, Jim, it means that we are, we step into the pain, right, that our clients are experiencing, right? That's what that means for us. So what does that value mean in your context? 
And, um, and boy, it's such a great discussion that we have with the leader and with then with his or her team after that. Here's the second question. Why does it matter? Right. Who cares? And, and so it's a wonderful discussion again. Why, why does that matter? So why does compassion, the way we define it for our organization, matter? Right. Why? I mean, for me, Jim, and maybe you want to speak to this. Yeah. Um, for me, it matters because I remember being a 34-year-old lead pastor of a growing church who was on the brink of suicide. Right. Right. And I had some compassionate people who could step into that with me. Right. And I wouldn't have made it without them. Yeah. And I want myself, I want you, I want the rest of our team to have that ability to step into the pain of right. our clients. It matters to me because um, a leader, oftentimes, Jim, doesn't have somebody they can talk to about things like that. Yeah. And we want to be that for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, we talk a lot at Converge about your passion, your pain, your right. proficiency to help kind of put some bullseyes on your on the trajectory of your life. And that that pain, what I'm hearing is that, you know, compassion is to encompass what is in pain with what, with what is, is here to help, right? It's right. we come to help because we've been there and we know how difficult that was and how lonely it can feel and how isolated you are and how even in, in some ways ashamed of wanting to quit your calling, wanting to quit, you know, relationships, wanting to quit ministry um, and, to, and to not, to, you know, to come in as a non-judgmental person and go, oh, we've been there. You know, we've yeah. been right here and the good news is we know the way out. And That's right. uh, so compassion, why does it matter? Because it's so satisfying to take your, your misery and, and make it your ministry, right? Yeah. It, it makes it all worth it. And, and you said there was three, what's, what's the third yeah. one? Well, let me give you, I just want, you just reminded me of something here real quick yeah. though, Jim, that I want, I want to make sure we talk about. Um, can the compassion, the way we define it, is patient with people as they make their way through. Yeah. Now we're patient, but we also challenge, you know, yes. so it's, yeah. I see compassion that way, right? That, that uh -huh. I'm patient. I understand that um, problems, deep problems don't get solved in a linear fashion, yeah. that there are, there's yeah. progress, there's a digress, you know, there's regression, there's progress and there's, and it's, and I could, because we've experienced that, we understand that. Our, our clients never feel like we're like, come on, get with it, Jack, you know, although yeah. there are those moments where we have to give them a, a little nudge, you know, sure. and sure. say, look, okay, you need to make progress here. You're not, you're not doing your homework or yeah. um, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, I remember hitting the table one time in the meeting, talk about like, you might think it's not compassionate, right? But somebody, we're in, we were working with this uh, church for about four months and some guy on the vision team went back to something that we had worked on in month one and beat to death. And everybody on that, around that table said, I've got it. I understand this. I'm on board. I'm implementing. And yeah. four months later, somebody on that team said, like he wasn't even there in that right. first meeting. And I got mad. I was upset. Yeah. <laughs> so I hit the table. that someday. <laughs> I hit the table. I'll just ask Laura. She'll let you know. Yeah. You know right. <laughs> um, but I remember hitting the table, and I can't believe I did this. Yeah. You know, I just smacked the table, and I and I something came out of my mouth that wasn't bad. It was just forceful toward that person. <laughs> Everybody, the pastor's eyes, Jim, were like this. <laughs> yeah. But in a way, I felt like that was compassion, right? Like, come right. on. Right, right, right. Get with the program here. You said you were on board four months ago. What's the problem? What's happened in between month one and month? Right. So right. I went a little off the trail there, but I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to talk about that's what does it mean and why does it matter? Right, right. What happens if we do this well? Right. What happens if we don't? That's why it matters. Here's here's the third question we ask when we're refining values, core values, is how will it shape our behavior as a team? Right. So how does this compassion thing work as a team? Yeah. What does that look like? So Jim, when I was suffering with COVID, 
Yeah. You were reaching out to me. I don't know. Maybe it was every day or every other day for a few weeks sure. telling me you were praying for me that, you know, you, uh, what can I do to help all that kind of stuff? I mean, I think as a team, we do that. Well, we care about what's going on in each other's life. And I think every member of our team has faced something uh, yeah. in the since we've been together. Yeah. yeah. That's been challenging. That's been difficult. Right. And uh, I love the way our team does that for each other. And we interact and help. Yeah. So how will it shape our behavior as a team, as leaders? Because again, the, you guys are the culture of the church or the organization you're leading. So that's how we, re, we refine it. And that's usually like, a two to three hour discussion with a team. Yeah. And we come out with some language, common language. That's the goal, right? We come up right. with common language so that anybody who asks us, what is that? What does compassion mean? What does healthy work rest rhythm mean? We're all saying the same thing, not maybe verbatim, yeah. but we have the same talking points. So important because one person can define compassion as, you know, feeding children in Africa, can you have compassion international? The other one that's, compassion for the oppressed. And so that means we're now a political action committee. And other one thinks it's compassion for, you know, people that are misunderstood or it, it's, yeah, it, you have to bring definition to words. You have to paint pictures. You have to mm -hmm. have uh, almost case studies, you know, but compassion means this. And, yeah. you, and you tell those three testimonies that best illustrate what you mean by compassion. And now, now we're creating culture, right? Now we're not just using words as slogans, you know, I, I, every, when you and I were kids, we used to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, hand over your heart, look at the, mm -hmm. the flag. I don't think we knew what that meant. We did it, but it wasn't creating the culture of being an American that pledged allegiance. We didn't know what the word allegiance meant, right? So right. language without, without pictures, without identifying what that means, what you value, it, it's their creeds maybe, right? Or their the repeated words, but really we're talking about changing something um defining something empowering right. something so now we're, we're going to use core values right the, now that we've identified them now we have some language now that we all mean the same things now we have to go about you know there's about five people in that room but we've got 50 people or 150 people or five thousand people now that need to embrace this to create mm -hmm. culture what do you how do you do that how do you say we've identified compassion and now we're going to change the world through that that value and so I want to give you four quick things here, Jim, about that. And these happen in cascading fashion. Okay. By that, here's what I mean. So I'm going to, each one of these four things, I'm going to do with myself and my, my executive team or my leadership team or my staff or my lead volunteers, right? Yeah. Depending on how you're set up. We're going, to, we're going to do these four things at that level first. Right. And we're going to get it. We're going to practice it. We're going to, we're going to do that well within that small group. And then we're going to cascade it down to the next level right. of leadership. And we're going to do it all over again, but it's going to be, it's going to be, and then eventually we're going to cascade it down to the entire business or to the entire church uh, mm -hmm. that we're leading. So these four things happen best in my opinion, in that kind of cascading fashion. So here we go. The first one is teaching. Okay. Right. So we encourage leaders to do a, once you have really grabbed onto those values and you've defined them and refined them, um, then you want to teach those values. Right. Um, again, remember, we're teaching them at various levels. Teaching is one way. The second one is more important than the teaching, and that is modeling. Yeah. Yeah. Because values are more caught than taught. I'm not saying we shouldn't teach them but they're more caught than taught. We, you know, I teach them uh, in, in our quarterly meetings uh, yeah. with our team. We're all yeah. over the country. So we meet once a quarter uh, yeah. to gather. And, uh, and so one, sometimes in those meetings, we're talking about values or we're celebrating uh, uh, people that have, uh, uh, have lived those out really well. But mm -hmm. modeling it is very, very powerful. Third piece is celebration. Um, I learned this as a parent that when I celebrated good behavior, I got farther down the road yeah. than uh, only f uh, punishing bad behavior. Right. And so what gets celebrated happens over and over and over again. Right. So when somebody on the leadership team lives that out, I wanna make sure that 
not only did they know that I noticed, I want the rest of the team to know that I noticed. Right. right. And, um, and so that modeling of it, uh, that celebrating of it is really, really important. And we're yeah. talking about shaping, right? This yeah. doesn't happen in a week. This doesn't happen in a month. You're never mm -hmm. done doing this, by the way. Right, right. Yeah, good. Always going to be doing this. And if you don't like that fact that you're always going to be working on this in one way, shape, or another, um, you're going to have a hard time getting the fuel yeah. out of culture that you really are looking for. And then right. the fourth piece of this, Jim, we're talking about how do we shape culture? It's accountability. Yeah. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, let me give you an example. I think, I think there are some organizations that will keep a strong performer who isn't a cultural fit. Yeah. yeah. Because that strong performer is producing. Mm -hmm. But it creates a lot of problems. Yes. Um, you know, it sends, first of all, it sends a loud and clear message that the organization isn't all that serious about the core values. Right. <laughs> right. So we have really good music. Yeah. It's, a, right. it's on the wall. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, when we tolerate behavior that flies in the face of our core values, it, it creates cynicism. Yeah. It, it, it becomes difficult to reverse that. And yeah. so when you as a leader take the difficult step of either bringing behavioral correction to that, and if they don't, uh, if they don't modify their behavior, letting that person go, that sends a powerful message about your commitment to the values. You know, in, in our culture here, workaholism is a fireable offense. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you might think that's harsh. Well, I care too much about you and your wife right. and your kids to right. let you do that to yourself and to them. Right. Secondly, if I let you get away with that, you weaken our moral authority. Yeah. I can't, we cannot speak with authority to the, to, to the lives of leaders and say, hey, slow down. If we're not doing that. Right. And so there's this accountability piece of culture shaping that is really powerful. It's really important. Um, and, it, and, and honestly, Jim, I don't believe I'm helping somebody who's a culture mis a values mismatch yeah. uh, to stay on board. If, if we can't get them to modify, to learn to buy in, yeah. I'm not helping them. They're not helping the organization. They're not helping me. Everybody loses. Right. Um, when I tolerate that kind of behavior. So those well, are the four it. pieces. And in the culture of Converge, to achieve burnout, we would have to have lied to you and each other for a long period of time. That's right. right? And so it isn't, it isn't just that it happened one day. This is something that would have gone on. So it's not just you, you're removing the moral authority. You've lost moral credibility mm -hmm. because you know what we value. And you decide to do exactly the opposite of what we've clearly stated repeatedly for years that we value and, and why we value that. So that's, right. yeah. So teaching, modeling, celebration, and, and, and accountability to those yes. things. I, I had somebody say what you think about this. Someone said to me, some of vision, uh, which is kind of culture, but, but it's a uh, vision is made a little different. They said about the time you're tired of talking about it, most of your people are just starting to get it. That's right. Do you think that's true? Uh, I absolutely think it's 100% true about vision. It's 100% true about core yeah. values and culture. Yeah. Um, I, so here's a, here's a quick tip. Here's a, here's a cheat code for you yeah. if you're listening. So there are 13 Sundays in a quarter. Yeah. Every quarter, I would encourage you to take a little window on a Sunday to talk about values. Yeah. To talk about culture. Do do a little teaching or do some celebration. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody is, has been identified by one of your team as they lived out this core value. Let's, let's make a big deal of that in front of the entire congregation, right? In front of yeah. the entire organization. And let's celebrate that. Um, every, once every quarter, I want to talk about vision in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. It doesn't have to be an entire sermon on it. Yeah that's two times in a quarter. So if I can hit once a quarter, I'm hitting values. Once a quarter, I'm hitting vision in some way, shape or form. And I've got creative people around me who can help me figure out how to do that in a creative way. And I don't always have to be the mouthpiece for it. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm slowly shaping and molding the culture. Yeah. And that activity will go on for our, in, as long as I'm leading Converge Coaching, as long as you're pastoring Freedom Center, yeah. that kind of values shaping, culture shaping activity will have to happen until either we both die or we move on to something else. Yeah. Um, it's never finished. It's never uh, done. Right. It's never finished. It's never done. But again, it, I don't want it to be finished. I, I like using the power of culture. I, it's once, once the culture is right, it saves what, what percentage of, of the effort do you think trying to correct the culture that's right? It's 80% of, it could be, it's hard to estimate, but it's yeah. powerful. It, it's power. It takes so much pressure off of you as a leader. Yeah. Right. Um, really, like you say, in the rumble strips too, because you know, as your church grows or as, as, as any influ influence at all, there's somebody that goes, the reason for this gathering is because I need a, a downline in my MLM or I need voters mm -hmm. for my cause or I need, you know, a wife uh, and, and I'm single or I need, it's funny how people are attracted to groups of people so they can kind of take those groups of people in their direction. And I think these really do guard the integrity of the church. And there are a lot of causes and there's a lot of churches that should embrace these causes, but but every church cannot embrace every cause or they'll just go in a million different directions. You, you need to know where you're going, what you're called to do, what you're anointed to do. And I think by defining and refining this culture, by communicating it consistently and whether it's on T-shirts or from sermons or, you know, the mentioning on a weekly basis, those sorts of things. It Once you create the culture, it is a wonderful servant to the overall goal and becomes kind of a master over the, those who would subvert the culture in a different direction. And it's, I, you know, taking two episodes to talk about this is not overstating it. I, we could do 10 episodes on this and probably will over the course of a year, but the right culture, it, it is, it just saves you so much time and energy. And one of the most beautiful things I've seen, Jim, and then I'll have you wrap us up here is yeah. when I see the, the, the lay folks, the lay people in an organization shaping culture yes yeah when i hear somebody I overhear somebody at our church talking to somebody about a they're complaining about one of our leaders yeah. and i hear that person say we don't do that here yeah <laughs> i love that it's so powerful yeah and it, and it can become that where peop, the people are actually policing it at some point. yes you, you always have to lead the charge yeah. But it's wonderful and beautiful when um, people who don't have a title, people who don't don't have a public platform that they speak, you know, to uh, or from, but they're actually yeah. shaping and and helping to to maintain that beautiful and healthy culture. It's it's a it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, too. it's it, when when God shows you something and you communicate it faithfully over the course of years, and then people start to say, "I see it too." That's an extremely rewarding moment in, in a, a leader's life. When, when what God spoke to me at a burning bush is now publicly known and we're free from Egypt. That's, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful moment. Yeah. Yeah. John, thank you so much for this. And uh, again, you've said it repeatedly in the last two podcasts, this one and the one before, this is not something we just kind of write on the back of a paper plate as we drive down the street. And right. this is, this certainly isn't something you should just adapt because uh, another church that's, that's successful has these four core values. So there are core values. This is something that is as personal as, a, as an individual's walk with the Lord and mm -hmm. calling and anointing. So uh, it starts with the individual, it spreads to the leadership team, it, it spreads through teaching, modeling, celebrating and accountability to a congregation. That's a process. And, yeah. and I know one of the things that you do well is you help people through this process. What, how would we get a hold of you to say, we need this. Um, culture is not our friend. Uh, I'm fighting a culture. It's poorly defined. It needs to be redefined. And I, I need an outside voice to help me do this well. Because I, as the leader, I need confidence in what I'm going to say. Because people say, well, I don't see that. I see this. Now it's muddy water instead of a clear, concise vision. How do we go about doing that with you? Jim, it's really simple. I mean, just uh, the, the first way to get to us is by our website, ConvergeCoach.com. Yeah. And uh, you click on a contact us link and you can give us, uh, tell us, hey, I would like to talk with you about the possibility of you helping us with 
shaping, yeah. identifying values, and then using those values to shape a culture that is healthy. Um, you know, that's that's the starting point. We do we have done a lot of that. If you know, and if you don't, uh, if if you'd like a reference clients, we've got those too. Like I, people that we've helped, uh, pastors that we've helped, churches that we helped, that would be happy to say, hey, we had Converge do this for us, and here's what happened. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how that's how I would uh, I would uh, say to get uh, rolling with the process. Great, great. Thanks, John. And and thank you to all of you who have joined us today. We're always grateful that you've taken the time and invested it with us. Right. Um, but this is what we do. Um, one of the things we do, but it's, it's all for the same reasons. And that is to be a resource for you, a friend to you, um, a partner with you. So anything we can do for you, please let us know. God bless you. And we continue to just serve for you, with you, around you, as you continue to lead from alignment. Thank you.